like to extend a special thank you and welcome to the friends of History Cambridge who have made tonight's event possible. Um, and if you want to consider joining that group, head over to our website, which is historycambridge.org, and click on the support button at the top of the page. You can also sign up there to receive our e notice so you don't miss out on great future events like these. And a reminder that tonight's event is free, but donations are welcome. And a big thank you to many of you who did make a donation. We really appreciate it. After tonight's event, you'll be receiving a survey asking how you liked it. Please fill that out. It helps us a lot. We love feedback. We want to know how we're doing. We want to know what you liked and what you think we can be doing better. So, um, And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Janie Victoria Ward is Professor of Education and Program Chair of Africana Studies at Simmons University in Boston, Massachusetts. She holds a master's degree in counseling and consulting psychology and a doctorate in human development from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Her book, The Skin We're In, Teaching Our Children to Be Emotionally Strong, Socially Smart, and Spiritually Connected, published by the Free Press Simon & Schuster in 2000, focused on racial socialization in Black families. Her new book, Sister Resisters, Mentoring Black Female Students in College, will be published by Harvard Education Press in the spring of 2022. For over 30 years, her professional work and research interests have centered on the developmental issues of African-American adolescents, focusing on identity and moral development in African-American girls and boys. Along with her teaching responsibilities, Professor Ward continues to work with youth counselors, secondary school educators, and other practitioners in a variety of settings. Welcome, Dr. Ward. We're so thrilled that you could join us, and we're handing it over to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all about a project that I've been involved in, um, in which I've uncovered um, all these little pieces of history um, of uh, African Americans in a section of West Cambridge, the section that I live this in. Section. And that's what I am um, looking forward to share with you, um, my personal story of this journey, um, as well as some stories about um, African American history from the 1700s up until um, 1948, um, which is when uh, my parents purchased this home. And the first thing I wanna do is I am going to um, share the screen and um, share this map. Can everybody see the map? It may not be the easiest thing to see, because it is um, a street map, but I wanted to point out to you the area that I'm going to be talking about. The area here that is yellow is the Longfellow House, which means that to the right is Harvard Square. The green mass over here is the common. As you go up Concord Avenue, well, let's see, Garden Street and Concord Avenue split um, around here. And so um, Concord will continue up the red line. This is Garden Street, which continues towards the Radcliffe Quad. The area that I am talking about is between Longfellow House and Buckingham Street, which goes up to where the Harvard Observatory is. My home is right here um, where Parker Street and Healy Street come together. If you were to drive down Healy Street after drinking a few too many, um, you would drive straight into my living room because my house is right at the intersection. Okay, so I wanted you to see the, the area that I'm going to be talking about tonight. And I will stop that share and go back to this. Uh, can you see me again? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so the big question for me has always been, how did my Black family end up in West Cambridge? At the edge of Old Cambridge, 
one of the most storied neighborhoods in the city. Um, well, in 1990, under Mayor Kenneth Reeves at the time, uh, Cambridge created the African American Heritage Trail, and they set up 20 plaques around um, the city commemorating African American historical figures and residences. That's when I learned from our pastor, Reverend Jeffrey Brown of uh, Union Baptist Church, he was one of the historians working on this, that Emery T. Morris lived in my house at 30 Parker Street. So I grew up in a city and among residents of a city who could speak of very storied histories, family members who came over on the, uh, the Mayflower, family members for whom buildings at Harvard or MIT have been named. My own family's history is considerably more modest. And frankly, I didn't really think about this much for several years. When you grow up black and female, so much of your history is lost to you. There are family stories, of course, but family members leave us. Marcus Garvey once said, a people without the knowledge of their past history and culture is like a tree without roots. Now, I'm not a historian, right? Um, I am a developmental psychologist. And I didn't, you know, I, um, I became much more interested in um, history going through this process. And this is the, um, I'm gonna share with you the process. A few years ago, years ago, I began a project that focused on the history of African-Americans in this little section of Cambridge. And in particular, I was interested in how my family story is interwoven into this larger story of African-American history in Cambridge and in the greater United States. So let's begin our story on Brattle Street. And I wanna talk about um, the three Vassal families. We'll start this history in the stately homes of Tory Row, still one of the best preserved historic areas of Cambridge. And this is years before the American Revolution. Two of those lavish mansions belong to the white Vassal brothers both part of a small group of wealthy English families, having accumulated their fortunes in the African slave trade and the sugarcane and cotton plantations in the West Indies. Now, these families were loyal to the king. Um, and at that point, there were about 90 uh, or so Africans who were residing in Cambridge. And for the most part, they were slaves of these and other wealthy English settlers and British loyalists. And this included Tony and his wife, Cuba. And as far as the historic record knows, uh, about six of their children, who of course were also enslaved. So as 1774 approached and the war seemed inevitable, fearing the fate of their um, lives at the hands of the rebels, the white vassals split. They wanted to get out of town and they abandoned their property to the trusted care of their black tenants. So once the white vassals were gone, Tony and Cuba kept the household functioning, choosing to squat on the land that was adjacent to John Vassal's um, house, where they lived rent-free and most importantly, um, free from um, bondage. And they were there taking, taking care of the place when in 1775, General George Washington arrives. He moves into the confiscated estate at 105 Brattle Street. And from there, he took charge of the newly established Continental Army, right? Today, that house 
that building is the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow House. Okay, so later, after Washington left, through a really odd um, turn of legal decisions that I'm still trying to understand, Tony petitioned the Commonwealth for the title of the property, okay? He went before the courts and he argued that after spending 60 years as a trusted and honest and faithful slave taking care of this place, he should be granted the vassal property. So the Commonwealth thought about it and they said, mm, no. However, they did decide to give him a sum of money. With that money, Tony and his, uh, went and purchased land about a quarter of a mile away from the Brattle Street house. It's um, in the area where Garden Street and Concord Avenue come together, right? So, um, for those of you who know Cambridge, I'm talking about in front of the, or the area around the Longis School down the street from what is now known as the Radcliffe Quad. So even back then, uh, you know, the, the slaves understood the value of property, right? Um, and free black men uh, as well. One of the daughters married a Lewis. Now, recently, and I suspect that many of you who are involved with the Cambridge Historical um, Organizations have heard that um, historians have discovered remnants of an entire African-American settlement on Walker Street. And Walker Street is right off of Garden, across the street from the monument. They called this area Louisville. And in the first five or six decades of the 19th century, we believe that a small community of freed Black Americans managed to sustain themselves, right? Um, and some of them even prospered in old Cambridge. Now, we don't know a lot about this community, um, but one of the things that we do know is that um, in the 1820s, the American Colonization Society really started to take root. They're the, the people who were arguing, um, you know, they were, uh, they were thinking that, well, we got this black problem, right? And maybe if we can figure out a way to get some of these slaves to move back to Africa, it would solve this, this uh, slavery problem that we have. There were some black folks who had been denied, having been denied the full citizenship, the full rights of American citizenship. Um, and they were just absolutely desperate for freedom any way they could get it. There were blacks who joined up with the American Colonization Society. And according to um, Charlie Sullivan and his very careful work and Maycock's work, it seemed that there were a group that went from the Louisville community to Liberia and West Africa, right? They chose to move in the 1850s. But one of the things that we know about this um, expatriation and um, African-Americans moving back to the African continent is that due to the very harsh conditions and the very high death rate, a lot that they encountered once they got to the African continent, which of course they were not used to and um, uh, um, did not know how to, um, their bodies were not uh, prepared for the harsh conditions that they encountered, many of them did not return. So that by the 1860s, only about 37 African-Americans, that's 37, lived in Old Cambridge. And they either lived in the Louisville area, 
right? So around Longy School, between Longy School and um, Cambridge Common, um, or, uh, or they were scattered in other areas in um, West Cambridge. About a decade later, Louisville was no longer the vibrant black community that it had been. The community had shrunk considerably. Um, we were dealing with a war and eventually their properties were divided up and the few people who were there left and moved on to other areas. The Lewis tomb, right, um, which made the news a few years ago, uh, was a small black graveyard that initially was established in 1835. That's what the Cambridge records say. Um, that too got sold for development in the 1870s. The remains of the people of Louisville were dug up and reburied in unmarked graves in Cambridge Cemetery where it just so happens um, my own parents are buried. Okay, so we're going to leave behind the story of the African-Americans of Louisville in West Cambridge and turn our attention to um, another character who lived in the neighborhood who I discovered had a fascinating connection to African-American history in this area. Um, so up the street and around the corner from Parker Street. So if you go start on Parker, you walk up Healy, you meet up with Buckingham Street. And as you start to walk up Buckingham, which has a incline, it's a hill towards Concord Avenue on the left, is the home, there's a historical marker, um, and it's the home of Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Okay, so who was he and what role did he play in African-American history? Okay, let me tell you a little bit about him. First off, he was a white universalist minister and he was a radical abolitionist. In fact, he was so radical that a couple of his congregations kicked him out, okay? They thought, okay, that you're a little bit too much for us to deal with. He's also best known probably for three major events in American and African-American history. First was his participation in the failed attempt to release the legendary um, fugitive slave, Anthony Burns. Um, Anthony Burns, uh, this was during um, you know, the period uh, in which the fugitive slave law said that anybody who came in contact with a um, fugitive slave, right? And who knows which black person um, you know, uh, fits that category. But if you came in contact with that person, you were morally and legally obligated to turn that slave over to um, the, own, the person who said that they owned that person. The abolitionists, of course, hated this. Nobody more than um, Higginson. So Anthony Burns um, had been captured and he was being held for extradition in a Boston courthouse. A bunch of abolitionists got together, went to the courthouse and demanded his release. Higginson had a battering ram and was banging on the door, door busts open and all hell breaks loose, um, which was covered in all of the papers of the time. A court officer was actually killed in this melee, and yet Higginson, and they think that Higginson did it, but Higginson was never arrested. Don't quite know why. Second thing that Higginson is famous for is that he was a member of the Secret Six. So what's the Secret Six? This was a group of abolitionists that got together 
and help finance John Brown's 1859 raid on Harper's Ferry in Virginia, right? These are the guys that put up the money and bought the guns. And in fact, Higginson was one of the people who actually did the gun running, we call it today. He put the guns in his carriage and um, took them there. So uh, as we know, the armed insurrection, uh, John Brown's raid ultimately failed. John Brown himself was hung. Um, and a bunch of the abolitionists up north, once that happened, got really nervous. Some of them um, head for the hills. Um, one went to Canada. Apparently one uh, had a nervous breakdown. Um, the other guys were really laying low. Higginson, on the other hand, Higginson was like, yeah, I did it and I'll do it again. Okay, totally unrepentant. Still didn't get arrested again. Don't quite understand that part either. Now, the third story I wanna share with you um, is probably less well known and was actually the most interesting to me. And that is that in 1862, Higginson was asked to take command of the first South Carolina volunteers. That was a Union Army regiment composed of escaped slaves from South Carolina and Florida. Now, often confused, Higginson's regiment of escaped slaves fighting in the Civil War were actually organized before the Massachusetts 54th Volunteer Infantry. That came the next year in 1863. And that group was composed of free Blacks. Um, the Hollywood movie Glory, you know, the one with Denzel Washington, told that story. But the bravery of the first South Carolina volunteer um, uh, infantry is another of the countless stories of Black history that's largely absent in the narratives of American history. Now, I had been teaching at Simmons College courses on um, Black women. And um, uh, so as I'd be talking about uh, Black sheroes, including Harriet Tubman um, or Susie King Taylor, um, but what I didn't know is how these two women's lives and careers were intertwined with Higginson's, okay? Um, just so you'll know, uh, Susie Taylor was the first black nurse during the Civil War. She actually worked with Clara Barton. She was horribly disrespected by Clara Barton and the other white women that she was working with, but nonetheless, she hung in there and worked alongside um, these women. Okay, now, um, both women ended up being stationed in South Carolina in Higginson's unit, okay? Susie King Taylor worked as what they called a laundress, um, which basically meant that her job was to sort of um, clean up behind um, these horribly injured soldiers. And she was a nurse for the wounded of the first um, South Carolina volunteer infantry. And Harriet Tubman also was a nurse, but she was a cook, she was a scout, and most importantly, she was a spy, okay? So Higginson actually knew Harriet Tubman before they met up in South Carolina. Um, and although there was a $12,000 bounty on her head, right? At the time, he didn't care. He trusted Harriet Tubman and he trusted her ability 
to pull off one of the most clandestine operations of the war. And this is what they did. It's 1863 and a group of black soldiers and white officers from the unit executed a secret overnight military operation that managed to free 750 black men, black women and children who had been enslaved, right? Um, and they called this the Kabahi River Raid. The fact that they were able to get that many black people out of danger, out of slavery, out of the state so that they could make their way to freedom is absolutely astonishing, right? Um, and after that raid, which was led by Harriet Tubman, a black woman, right? After that raid, the critics in the North and in the South could no longer pretend that black people were unfit for military service. Okay. Before that, they thought Black people were not smart enough, that they didn't understand strategy, that they didn't know how to follow orders. All of that was blown up by this one Black woman, Harriet Tubman. As for Susie Taylor, it turns out that she was the first and only Black woman to ever publish an account of her experiences in the Civil War. And she did that in 1902. And who was it who encouraged her to put pen to paper and write up her experiences? My neighbor, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, right? So I was absolutely astonished at the role that Higginson managed to play in African-American women's history. And maybe later on, I'll tell you about a few other things that he did as well. But now we're up to um, uh, around the 1890s. When my parents moved, uh, now my parents did not move in in the 1890s, but I wanna just tell you about um, Parker Street in the 1890s. When my parents moved into the second floor apartment, um, of 30 Parker Street, which they own, they inherited two tenants, an older black woman in the apartment on the third floor and a retired single black man who lived below us on the first floor. When I was growing up, um, the house leaned dramatically to one side, having been built on a marshy area of unstable land just below the foundation. There are a few houses um, on Parker Street that have this problem. Now, while I was doing this research, I learned that the real estate developer um, at the time, a gentleman by the name of Souther Blakely, built up the area on Parker Street and Healy Street on top of a brook that used to feed Craigie Pond. Right? So it was always marshland. And what he did was he sold these houses to unsuspecting African Americans. One of those homes was sold to a descendant of the Lewis family. Okay. Um, and in fact, when I grew up in the 1950s and 60s, there, uh, there was the Lewis house, there were members of the Lewis family that were still living on Parker Street. Another one of these houses was sold to Emery T. Morris. That was 30 Parker Street, where I now live. So who is this Emery T. Morris? He is the gentleman that the plaque is um, talking about and that's uh, posted in front of my house. He was a black man, of course. He came from a politically active family. Um, and the story about him is that he was going to run for political office in the city of Cambridge. 
But the city fathers got together and they said, oh, no, 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 this is not going to work. And instead, they offered him a position in order to keep him from running in the race. The position that they offered him was be, being the deputy sealer of weights and measures. So that story that he is the first African-American um, with that kind of uh, uh, municipal job, um, that's the backstory. But there are some other things about Emory T. Morris that's interesting to know. Along with W.E.B. Du Bois and you know, some others, they founded the Niagara Movement, which was the precursor to the national to the establishment of the National Association uh, for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, right? The two were close friends. In fact, W.E.B. Du Bois probably hung out in this house. Just imagine how exciting it is for um, you know, a professor of Africana studies to find out later in her life that W.E.B. Du Bois used to hang out in your house. Um, I had heard rumors that there had been an extensive library in this house on slavery, how somewhere maybe on the third floor in the attic, and this library had been frequently used by researchers, um, Harvard faculty members and students, right? Um, but it was just a rumor and nobody knew for sure if this was true. When I renovated the house um, back in the uh, 1990s, you can imagine the first thing I was looking for, um, didn't find it, couldn't find any books. They had been long gone. However, in doing this research, I did find some other clues. I found a handwritten note, not in my house, but it's part of the uh, record found a handwritten note from W.E.B. Du Bois to um, Emmett T. Morris's wife, okay? Um, it was addressed to the house, 30 Parker Street, and it had something to do with a club membership matter. And then also regarding this anti-slavery library, I found another letter written by an early African-American scholar by the name of William Henry Ferris, thanking Emory and his wife for their kindness and for the use of the library, which he had been told about by Thomas Wentworth Higginson, okay? And it also mentioned that Higginson used to walk down Buckingham, um, down Healy Street to Parker, to read some of the um, uh, materials that were housed here at 30 Parker Street. So that was like thrilling for me. Okay. All right, zoom ahead, almost done, 1938. A scandalous marriage takes place and it joined the lives of a black attorney by the name of Julian Steele and a white female Boston socialite by the name of Mary Bradley Dawes. And um, they purchased the house shortly after their wedding. Now, Mary was a direct descendant of William Dawes, you know, the man who became famous for the historic ride with Paul Revere. The British are coming, the British are coming. Yeah, uh, that was one of her relatives, um, but not for long after she married this black man. Julian Steele had been the director of the Robert Gould Shaw Settlement House in the South End, and he had served as the past president of the Boston chapter of the NAACP. All of that came to a crashing end when he was relieved of both positions upon announcing his intention to marry outside of his race. My parents had lived on Parker Street for seven years before I was born. 
And this was the end of World War II. My mother, Lillian Hopkins, was the housekeeper for a wealthy young Jewish family whose lawyer husband was on the Harvard Law School faculty and they lived on Bond Street. My father, who had served in the war, settled in Boston, married my mother, and they purchased this property at 30 Parker in 1948 from Julian Steele and Mary Dawes. Now, by the late 1940s, that Black people could purchase a home in West Cambridge was already unusual. That my father was able to do so was particularly unusual, given that so many African-American veterans were denied the benefits of the GI Bill. More often than not, local banks denied these mortgages. Um, they denied mortgage loans to us and we were forbidden from purchasing homes in predominantly white neighborhoods due to deed covenants and acts of overt and covert racism. But we were able, my father was able to purchase this home. Following my parents' death, deaths in 1981 and 1993, I moved into this house on Parker Street where I raised my son and hopefully preserve the memory of these incredible African-American resistors and their white allies. So that's the story of my neighborhood and how my family story is interwoven into this larger story of African-American history in Cambridge and in the greater United States. And I think that it counters the narrative of our invisibility and lack of importance, and it uncovers a history that many of us never knew. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. That was fascinating. And I know that we have a lot of folks that would love to ask questions. So please go ahead and type sure. them in the chat and we will relay them. Um, I had, while folks are doing that, I did have one question. Yep. I was just curious if you could speak a little bit to the um, school situation in Cambridge, particularly segregation or, um, and integration of schools in Boston versus Cambridge and the effect that that had on the black community in Cambridge. You know, I, I don't know. I'll tell you the one thing I do know. Um, the, uh, the one thing that I came across as I was, um, um, looking at the history of this house, right? Because it's because that's largely what I'm focusing on, the history of my house and my neighborhood. Um, Emery T. Morris was the nephew of Robert Morris, okay? Robert Morris, um, people may not know this story, but in the 1800s, a group of Black parents got together and um, uh, tried to sue the Boston School Committee because their children were not permitted to go to the school that was closest to where the Black community was. We're talking about the Black community that was up in the Beacon Hill area. So they were um, fighting the segregation of um, black children in the Boston public schools, they were fighting for desegregation. Robert Morris was the black attorney who took on that case along with um, Charles Sumner, okay? Um, the reason this was historic was at that time, 18, I think it's like 1840 something or rather 1850 something, there were only two black attorneys in the United States, period, okay? And Robert Morris was the first to actually win a court trial. He didn't win that trial, um, eventually did sort of desegregate the schools, but it was not because of um, that court case. That didn't happen until a hundred years later. So um, the Morris, 
um, family story is both a Boston story as well as a Cambridge story. As for the Cambridge Public Schools, I, I don't know. I have not investigated that. Um, and maybe there's somebody in the uh, audience who knows more about the history of the Cambridge Public Schools than I do. Thank you. Um, we do have a, a question. Um, I was curious about where in Cambridge were Black residents between the 1950s and the 1980s when urban renewals and displacements were happening? Where were they? Uh, meaning where, where did they live? Yes. Yes. Says, okay. Yes. <laughs> I see that. Yeah. Um, you know, I I can tell you that when I was growing up, um, so 1950s and 60s, in this area of West Cambridge, um, I had a black family to the right of us. Um, the house that, uh, as you move up Concord Avenue, that was a black family. Across the street was a black family. Um, further down the street were the Lewises. The Dunnings were another black family. Um, so Parker Street had um, quite a few African Americans. Um, by the time we got into the 1960s, a few families left. Um, the family next door moved to Newton for the schools, bigger house, et cetera, et cetera. By the time we get into the 1970s, Black families that we knew in the area um, were, you know, the property value was skyrocketing and they were selling homes and, and moving out of the area. So I think that um, from my own personal experience, there were um, a number of Black families as you go down Concord Avenue, um, Walden Street, Fairweather Street, um, Chilton Street had Black families that I remember and interacted with. Some of those families are around. A lot of those families um, are no longer, um, no longer own the property. Um, and like I said, some folks left, you know, um, for greener pastures in another community. Um, other folks, children grow up and they decide they don't want to take over the property that their parents lived in. They might have moved to another um, area of the country. Now, of course, you know, you can't get back into this area of Cambridge. It is um extremely expensive put it that way which is really a shame okay our next question um paula says hi janie you have briefly mentioned the tenants who lived in the house when your parents purchased it mm -hmm. can you say who they were and can you also mention some of the people who have also been tenants in that house or on that street specifically i am thinking about authors Teresa and imani perry yeah Okay. Um, so when I was a little girl, um, I, I, Mrs. Tyler, Pearl Tyler, lived on the third floor. And on the first floor was Mr. Goosley. Um, I think his name was Arthur Goosley, um, who was the first Black man I'd ever met who played golf. Okay, go figure. That's that is the memory that I have of Mr. Uh, Goosley. Um, I did not know any of their family members and I um, have done Google searches and I, for both individuals and have not been able to find anything um, about them. Um, as for, so, so let's see. Um, there have been a number of families that have lived in the house. Um, there is a family that um, uh, eventually moved to Lexington. Um, there was a woman and she had a child. They eventually moved to Maryland. And in the 1980s, 
following um, her, uh, when she finished her degree, we were both in the same program, Teresa Perry and I were in the same program at Harvard. Teresa finished before I did, and uh, which meant that Harvard was gonna boot her out of um, uh, uh, graduate housing. And my mother happened to have a, um, an apartment. And so my mother said, nope, you have to move in here with that little girl. Imani Perry at the time was maybe eight years old. And my mother, um, Imani often says, uh, became her grandmother, her second grandmother. Um, now, in case folks don't know who Imani Perry is, she is um, quite famous, uh, a professor at Princeton University and is often on TV and um, writes these incredible books. Um, but she likes to say that she got her start here um, at 30 Parker Street, living in the apartment that I am in now. Um, she actually wrote a very small piece about um, 30 Parker Street and had uncovered, um, she had uncovered that um, um, the singer's wife, I'm trying to remember, the guy who does uh, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Nat King Cole. Thank you, Nat King Cole's wife um, had a connection here um, on Parker Street and I'm still trying to track that one down too. Thank you. Our next question is curious if Will William Lewis on Upland Avenue is part of the same Lewis family in the Walker Street area of Louisville. I don't know. I, I would not be surprised if he is. Um, I mean, that Lewis family goes way back, right? And so what's amazing to me is that the Lewis family can get tied back to Tony and Cuba vassal right? Some of the first Africans that set foot in old Cambridge, right? So I would love to know if there are still some, um, uh, uh, some members of the Lewis family who are, are still around. Yeah. I know that they do, they no longer live in the house on um, Parker. Okay. Our next question, um, says, hi, thanks so much for this information. Do you have ideas on how to best make this history better known? Yeah, well, you know, I, um, I am on a committee with the city that's been talking about how should the city commemorate, what should the city do with some of the monuments and markers and public art that currently exist, and um, um, in other words, um, like I gave you a snippet of uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson's story. However, the plaque that's in front of his house says something like, he was an abolitionist, he was a minister, and he was a friend of Emily Dickinson. It, you know, it's like, cause they, they only had like 25 words or something, they're limited. So the history of this man and how this man's um, history interacted with African-American history, you would never know unless you happen to be interested in, um, you know, doing some research on um, Higginson. So on this committee, um, that Denise Simmons has put together, Councilwoman Simmons has put together, we're, we're talking about, okay, um, what can we do with the markers? You know, we can't put up a huge billboard, right? That gives all the information, that's unreasonable. But maybe there are other ways in which we can um, create um, some kind of, uh, one idea that we're playing with is having a walking tour that could be, um, that one would go through with your telephone. So you could listen to, um, you know, somebody tell you about 
the history while you are standing in front of the house or um, you know, whatever the marker is. And then there would be a little bit more time to go into the story. Um, so there, people have been tossing around different ideas that have been tried out in other cities. And I think that um, Cambridge is um, in the process now of figuring out, um, you know, we have such a rich history here. We've got to figure out a way to get, um, to get it um, better known to a larger group of people. Thank you. Our next question, can you provide any insight of contributions made by my grandfather, Charles Moore? He served on the White House Council on Aging in 1970-71. He bought his house at 44 Clarendon Avenue in North Cambridge in 1944. You know, I don't know. I don't know, Mr. Moore. Um, but, you know, I think that if it's the 1970s, what I am finding is that it's a whole lot easier to do um, some research on Black folks, um, you know, sort of since the 1960s than it is to do the historical research. And so one of the things I would do, um, if he sat on um, a committee with that kind of notoriety and responsibility, I'll bet that there's a record of it somewhere. And then you sort of work backwards. Um, that's kind of how, that's how I started this project. I began with 30 Parker Street. Um, uh, you know, this guy lived there, uh, Emery T. Morris, who was he? Okay, and who was he connected to? And then what came before him? Um, so, so I do not know Mr. Moore, but I'll bet you, you could probably find out some information um, since he is sort of a contemporary almost. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, another question, how did your parents purchase the house? Was there a bank willing to lend to them? So this is also, a part of the story that I'm trying to figure out. Um, so my mother did domestic work and she had worked with um, a particular family. I'm not calling the name of the family because I just didn't ask their permission. Um, so she was their maid. And when they moved to Cambridge and my mother met my father, they wanted to make certain that their maid <laughs> lived close enough to their home to be able to, um, you know, work when they needed her to work. So when the house became, a, this, is, this is the family story. When the house became available on Parker Street, which was just down the street from where my mother worked, it was extraordinarily convenient. I think that that family helped my father to navigate um, the bank and the mortgage process. Another thing that I have to investigate is that um, the faculty member um, was very much involved in issues of anti-Semitism and um, injustice, okay? And it could very well be that he knew Julian Steele since Julian Steele was involved with the NAACP. So there might've already been a connection between these two lawyers, a white lawyer and a black lawyer. And then when my father came along and married the white lawyers made, okay, then it was like, okay, well, let's find them a house so that they can have a family, we can have a family, and everybody will live together, right? Thank you. Um, a quick question, was the Charles Sumner the same senator who was caned on the floor of Congress? Yes, yes. Yeah. same guy, same guy. You know, one of the things that 
um, I'm interested in is I call it um, interraciality, times in which African Americans and white Americans came together, you know? Um, sometimes they came together because, um, well, like Tony and Cuba were slaves and they worked for the vassals. Um, there was no choice there. But there was a black family and a white family that were living in very close proximity to each other. I mean, in the same house, although one group owned the other, okay. Um, then there are times in which African-Americans and white Americans have other kinds of relationships like Harriet Tubman and um, Thomas Higginson, right? Higginson meets Tubman probably through her work with the Underground Railroad, right? Because he and the abolitionists had been, um, you know, funneling money into the Underground Railroad, providing homes for slaves who were making their way up north or to Canada, and they came in contact with each other and became friends, okay? Another kind of relationship would be Julian Steele and the woman that he married, Mary Dawes, a truly intimate interracial relationship. So I'm sort of, I'm fascinated by these ways in which black people and white people came together, sometimes helping each other out, um, sometimes not so much, but that is something that I'm going to be writing about as I move forward. You actually took the words right out of my mouth because my last question for you was, um, what is next for your research moving forward? Yeah, well, like I said, that that is that is it. Um, uh, you know, especially right now, we're thinking a lot in America about, um, we're, we're of course thinking about the history of injustice, right? Um, and systemic racism, and that's really um, important to continue to uncover. But I also think it's important for us to understand the history of times in which we have come together, um, and not in some kind of silly kumbaya moment where, you know, let's all be happy. But um, um, what is it, um, when did our interests converge, right? Um, when was it that we really felt we needed each other in order to achieve um, a goal, especially if it's a common goal? So I'm interested in thinking about that. Um, I'm always interested in thinking about uh, where did all the Black folks in Cambridge go, right? Um, and so anybody who is um, pursuing this question, in their own communities, um, where were the African Americans uh, situated? How did they get there? Um, and if they are no longer there, what led to their departure? Um, I'm really interested in that question all over the city. Um, yeah, so those are the things I'm, and black women's history, okay? Anything that has to do with black women's history in Cambridge, I am, uh, thrilled with. Well, wonderful. That brings us to the end of our hour. I know there's so much more that we could delve into, but I so appreciate your being here, Dr. Ward, um, and, and gracing us with all of this wonderful information. Um, and I know it's just the start of, um, of a longer, much longer journey of investigation and, and discovery. Um, so I want to well, thank you. Thank you. Thank this you. This was fun. Too. This was a lot of fun. Um, I want to thank everyone else, everyone who is on the call for joining us tonight and our, our supporters for making it possible to bring this event to you free of charge. Um, and don't forget to be on the lookout for your survey link. We're going to send you that survey tomorrow. Um, and we are uh, very excited to hear all of your feedback. Um, and a reminder that this event was free. If you enjoyed our time here together tonight, please consider making a donation. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you all so much for coming and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.